was beautiful, wasn't it? The worship this morning has just been so awesome, thinking about the presence of God and and i um, thankful that we're in this place, you know, in the presence of God. I was just appreciating, um, I don't know, all the places we've been in the ministry over the years and thinking about all of those times and how much every time we, we sit and get prepared to hear the word, how we're just ushered into the presence of God and encouraged and refreshed. And um, it's just really an awesome privilege, isn't it? It's just such an awesome privilege. So um, now today, I hope we won't deviate from that theme. I was thinking, you know, as a as a pastor, and I consider myself a young pastor. Humor me with that. Um, as a pastor, it's a great privilege to be asked to preach in a service. And um, then I was thinking, as a church member, I have to question the the uh, wisdom of those that ask me, maybe. So, I'm having fun. Um, Let's pray. Father, this morning, we are certainly grateful for your presence. We are grateful for the eyes, Lord, that you've given us to see what you have for us to see. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you do call us to difficult decisions. You called Adam to sacrifice something that he had named. And yet, you are the decision maker, God. You are the one who draws us to your conclusion and to your presence and to the joy that comes out of making decisions with you. So, Father, we just thank you. We praise you. We ask you that you bless this time together now in your precious name. Amen. Um, As I was listening this morning to the earlier service, I was laughing because I thought about Bible college days, and we had a a class called um, the Preacher Boy class. And I think actually out of that class, when I was in Bible school, they made a booklet, Notes for Young Preachers 1 and 2. And it's filled with really awesome insight, pastor praying, you know, thinking about, uh, talking about what he's meditating on before a service and just the depth of, um, you know, what goes on behind the scenes when he's thinking about all the different types of people in a, in a service from the youngest to the oldest and from those that are working and those that are retired and yet asking God for a message that would speak to all those, those types of people in a new and refreshed way. It's just the incredible challenge. And as you're in the class, you're, you know, Especially as a youngster, you're thinking, I got to find out, like, what's the most important thing? Right before he goes to the pulpit, what's the most important thing? And Pastor Bob told the story as I was thinking about it this morning. Um, so they, we asked in the class, you know, Pastor, what's the, what's the last thing you think about before you come to the pulpit? And expecting this incredible deep revelation. And of course, he said, well, I check my fly to make sure it's <laughs> zipped up. I thought that is... Practical advice right there at its finest. Uh, As we speak about uh, the next topic in the subject from the card that we received, somewhere I received that card, but it's the eyes, right? Someone tell me I didn't read the wrong section. Okay, great, it's the eyes. I I put on my glasses this morning because I don't see as well as I do with my contact lenses, and that's so... Yeah, I don't have to see everybody. I can just think about the eyes. And uh, Pastor Horn, I can still see it. (laughs) Okay, the eyes, the eyes, the eyes of the Lord. And uh, thinking this morning about this topic, about the eyes and about Romans uh, chapter 12, 1 and 2, and about the renewing of the mind. And... We've heard so many awesome messages already about uh, how the refreshing and the renewing of the mind is really responsible for everything else. And, you know, the eyes are one of the few parts uh, in this message that are receivers. You know, everything out is output. The hand is an output. Um, Our walk is an output. But the eyes are receiving. 
right? Our ears are receiving, our eyes are receiving. As a matter of fact, um, the eyes are really an incredible part of our makeup. They're, did you know that our eyes start developing just two weeks after conception? It's incredible. One of the first things that's really starting to develop is the eyes. Um, the information that our eyes receive gets sent along our optic nerve, and then it's processed by our brain, and it helps us make appropriate decisions. That's why when somebody's throwing something at you, you know, you, you respond without even necessarily realizing why you're responding. I was thinking about a, an example of this. I was in the basement of my friend's house as a child, and we were playing darts, and I got the great idea that if I unscrewed the tip of the dart, the little metal tip off the plastic, I could throw it at him, and it would be funny. So I'm standing by the dartboard next to the door, and I unscrewed the tip, and I threw it at him. What I didn't take into consideration is he had a dart in his hand as well, and he threw it back at me, and before I could think, you know, I flung the door shut, and the dart landed like, you know, as I opened the door, I realized that dart was headed right from my, between my eyeballs. I said, what are you doing? He said, what were you doing? I said, I took the metal off the tip. He said, oh, I didn't know that. Don't throw darts at me. I learned something very valuable at that moment. Think before you throw a dart at somebody. But I was also thankful that God gave me a reaction, that the door shut. You know, I thankfully was in a place where I could, without even really thinking it, I just sh shut the door and it saved my eyes from a dart. 80% of our memories are determined by what we see. 80% of what we learn, according to some scholars, is through our eyes. But the eyes can't always be trusted, can they? Even in a practical sense, our eyes can't be trusted. Uh, I was reading about a case that happened in Australia when an Australian eyewitness expert, Donald Thompson, appeared on a live TV discussion about the unreliability of eyewitness memory. This is interesting as he's speaking about this. Later, he was arrested and placed in a lineup and identified by a victim as a man who had abused her. The police charged Thompson, although the abuse had occurred at the time he was on the TV show. They dismissed his alibi that he was in plain view of a TV audience and in the company of other discussants uh, including the assistant commissioner of police. The policeman who was taking his statement said, yeah, yeah, I suppose Jesus Christ and the Queen of England were there also. Eventually, the investigators discovered that the person who had been abused had been attacked at the same time that she was watching TV. The very program on which Thompson had appeared. Authorities eventually cleared Thompson. The woman had confused the abuser's face with the face that she had seen on the television while the abuse was happening. Very, very easy to see. Um, now, obviously there are, I'm not making any statements about, um, you know, court cases or anything like that, but just that the mind sometimes plays tricks on us, doesn't it? That we think we see one thing and really, something completely different is happening. And to consider this um, in a biblical sense, 478 references to the eyes in the Bible. Another 320 references to sight. So out of all those references to eyes and to sight, you know, where, where do we stand? How do we trust our eyes? Good question, isn't it? Actually, it's very interesting that in 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, while we, not, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Isn't it interesting that the things that are not seen 
are truly the things that matter the most when it comes to life with God? That the things that are seen oftentimes are temporal, and yet we are driven so many times by the things that are seen. Pastor Justin spoke this morning in his introduction about how men are drawn by vanity. And I thought that that's, that is so true. It so easily uh, happens to us that we can be drawn by vanity. And what is vanity? You know, something that is vain, something that really has no meaning or depth with God. And yet we are so easily drawn by our own increase, by our own self-glorification. Um, and it's really counterintuitive to us sometimes to stop looking for something that is seen and to look for something that is unseen, but it's the very thing that leads us to eternal life, is not focusing on what is seen. Ephesians 1.18 says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of the calling of his calling and, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. That we might see that thing, which is his hope, happens when the eyes of our understanding are enlightened by him. As I said, our eyes are drawn to vanity, but the mercy of God is brand new every single day, isn't it? It's the mercy of God that is new every single day. And when we consider this, this topic of the eyes in, in relationship to the renewing of our mind, to the refreshing of our mind, thank God that his character and his nature is that he is a refresher. Every single day, his spirit is renewed and refreshed in us. I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 6 for a moment, please. 2 Kings chapter 6. And we see here a little story of the king of Syria. And in verse 8, the king of Syria warned against Israel, warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Many times. In verse 11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants, and by the way, sore troubled means he got really ticked off. And he said unto them, Will you not show me which, of us, which is for the king of Israel? And one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. The things that you think are happening in secret, the man of God is counseling the king. Very interesting. And in verse 13, he said, Go and spy, therefore, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. And then, as we skip down, um, actually, let's keep reading. Verse 14, Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and came by night, and compassed about the city. And when the servants of the man of God was risen early, I like that, that the servant of the man of God rose early. There's not a, a slothfulness, but there's a, an, an anticipation of the day. And he meets the Lord, and he's on the lookout early in the day. And it says, uh, 
And when the servant of the man of, of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? In other words, oh my God, what are we going to do now? He looks out and he sees the whole host of chariots encompassed around them. And he says, what are we going to do, master? And he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now, if I was the servant of the man of God and I was looking out the window and taking stock at everything that was happening and looking at this incredible scene, maybe a little bit paralyzed in fear, and I turn to the man of God and say, what are we going to do now? And he says, don't worry about it because they that are with us are more than they that are with them. That's a real moment of challenge, isn't it? That's a moment when we stop and say, is he okay? Is he, you know, does he have double vision? Am I missing something here? In verse 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. He's a servant of the Lord. He's looking out the window. He is seeing, isn't he? Elisha says, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. This is incredible. He couldn't see until the Lord opened his eyes, and then he actually saw what was really there. Just pause for a moment and think about that in our own lives. Are we not faced with difficult circumstances that we look out the window of our life and we say, what are we going to do now? I don't know about you, but that seems to be a permanent address in my household. Right? If we weren't facing something, we'd be thinking, what's wrong? And actually, there's great fellowship with God in that place because you realize that if I perish, I perish. But also, we're expecting and excited for and looking toward the presence of God being perched around us in places that we had no idea until the Lord opened our eyes. And then we looked, and what did we see? We saw chariots with fire. The Holy Spirit in the mighty power of God surrounding us. And this is Psalm 37, 4, uh, excuse me, 34, 7, that the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. And then verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. It's not taste and see that the Lord is good, and then I'll give you the, the, the angels encompassing about you, but it's, hey, the angels are encompassing about you. Taste and see. Have the eyes of your understanding be enlightened by the Lord, that you may see the incredible deliverance of the Lord. And you know what it brings us to? And I was thinking about this as we were singing this morning. It brings us to the presence of the Lord. Imagine the servant of the Lord as he's looking out the window and his eyes have been opened and he looks and what does he see? The presence of God. And I, I was just being so stirred up in my heart this morning thinking about the presence of God, that the presence of God is a real thing. We might not see the presence of God in our daily activities, but from time to time and place to place and circumstance to circumstance, God opens our eyes and we get a split second view through the lattice of life at the presence of God and our hearts are stirred and we are quickened and we are challenged in our lives, and we are built up and edified, and we are thinking in the quietness of our hearts, I experience the presence of God. It's Acts chapter 3, verse 19, that in his presence are times of refreshing. I come into the church on Sunday morning, tired, maybe a little bit beat up from the week, or challenges of life, and we sit in the seat, and we're 
exhaling and we're, we're there and all of a sudden the eyes of our understanding are enlightened and the Spirit of God comes into our heart and we are quickened. You know what happens otherwise? This is what happens otherwise. In Numbers chapter 21, in verse 8 and 9, Pastor Schaller alluded to this Wednesday night a little bit, um, or Sunday night, rather. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, he shall live. Who said that to Moses? The Lord. He said, build the pole, build the serpent, put it up there. When you are bitten, look unto the brazen serpent, and they'll, they'll be healed. Everyone that looks unto him. And of course, we know that's, that's John 1, 4. Right? It's the picture of John 1, 4, that Christ is the life, and that is the light of men. Now it's interesting, in verse 9, Moses had this great idea. He made a serpent of brass, and he put it on a pole, and it came to pass. What was his great idea? To do exactly what the Lord had just told him to do. That was his great idea. That's the enlightenment of his eyes. Do what the Lord said to do, and he does it. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and he put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man... Then he beheld the serpent, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. When he beheld, when he looked upon it, he lived. Doesn't the Lord speak to us and say, behold, look? And as Christians, we don't want to be people who come to the place to hear the word of God and receive it in mechanical life going through the motions, hearing a message. Maybe it becomes idolatrous for us to go to services. Maybe we come because it's the right thing to do, and we give in the offering because it's the right thing to do, but we don't experience the life of God in it. How much more awesome is it to come because I'm going to experience the presence of God and to give because the presence of God is going to go from this place and we are going to be stirred in our hearts, and we're going to have an effect on the world. But we could fall into something that's different. God told Moses to build the, the serpent, right? To put the, the brazen serpent on the pole. It was God. Now let's look at 2 Kings 18.3. And this is the story of what happens to that, that brazen serpent. King Hezekiah. And in verse 3 of 18, it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and broke the images and cut down the groves and broke in pieces the brazen ser serpent that Moses had made. Wait a minute, didn't the Lord tell him to make it? So why is he breaking it into pieces? Well, because, as we read a little further, for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. They burnt incense unto the thing that was supposed to be the deliverance. That thing that was supposed to be looked unto to receive the life of God all of a sudden became a relic. All of a sudden became an idol. And they came out of religiosity and burned incense and looked at this relic and it no longer had the life of God in it. And the man of God recognized that and he crushed it into pieces and took it out of their view. Isn't it interesting that something that God gives us can be taken and made mundane? We can become familiar with it. It can lose its power. 
We can lose our joy. We can fail to understand the presence of God. And I really think it's because that thing which was designed to be beheld and looked upon became blindness. They were blinded by their own religiosity and need. And it lost its purpose. The things of God can so easily become mundane and idolatrous when we stop seeing the purpose of God and the presence of God in them. So what is the, what is the answer then? What am I to look upon? Well, with the presence of God in our lives in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, there is a sacrifice Right? There's a sacrificing of our bodies, a living sacrifice. And a living sacrifice is willing, as Abraham was, to go to the mountain with his son after God had spoken to him. And imagine that, that whole scenario. We won't speak about that whole topic, but imagine that he waited upon the Lord for all those years and God finally answers after all the troubles and then He's walking up and he's saying, well, where's the sacrifice? Dad, where, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham knows in his heart that, well, son, you might not see this, but God has a plan. And God did have a plan. And that plan involved the substitute. But he couldn't see the plan to involve the substitute until he let the Lord open his eyes to the bigger picture. And he was so convinced in his heart that if the Lord took his son, he'd raise him from the dead because the promise is the promise is the promise. We find ourselves in this world as believers today, especially in a place where we have an enemy. The king of Syria is angry with the things of God. Isn't that interesting? And not only angry with the things of God, but attacking the things of God because they, the things of God are in opposition to the things of this world. We already know. We can't look upon the things that are seen. The things that are seen are temporal. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. There's no consequences. There's no outcome thinking in the world. It's let's allow this thing to, to flourish because it makes everybody happy. But what happens when it doesn't make God happy? What happens when the consequences of my eyesight are limited by the death that is provided by my life that gets in the way of my ability to see the life that is in Christ that happens because of his death on Calvary. Christ is risen. My circumstances are going to be dead long after the situation is over. I can be caught up in circumstances in my life, but truthfully, what's the end result? Have I added any measure to my stature? Can I make myself taller by thinking about it? Unfortunately not. God's calling us to do one thing, and that's look unto him the author and the finisher of our faith. The author, the one that designed our faith. The one who created us calls us to walk with him in fellowship and with life and with joy. And can we walk with God and experience difficulty and troubles? Of course. Of course. Mama never promised us a rose garden or something like that, right? God didn't say, follow me, and you'll never have a trouble in your life. 
But didn't he say, follow me, and I will make you? Didn't he say, look unto me, and I will not only be the author of your faith, but I'll be the finisher of your faith? I'll be the perfecter. That's what that word means. It means to perfect. I will be the perfecter of your faith. Just one more statement here. The eyes of faith see the reality of the divine presence and the protection where there is normally vacancy or darkness to the ordinary eye. This is one commentator's view on the eyes. That the eyes of faith see the reality of the divine presence and the protection that it provides where when normal eyesight looks, all it sees is darkness and vacancy and difficulty and trouble. We could talk about difficulty all day long. I get tired of it. I do. I mean, we could talk about how bad the economy is going to be and how good it's going to be and how the next election is going to be this and this is going to happen and that's going to happen and we could spend all of our time being so occupied with the mundane that the life of God fails to take root in our hearts and we live just depressed and downtrodden and empty and vain. What are you going to do? I was here throwing words. Have a little drink, have a little smoke, get involved in an affair with a triangular thing involved, eat more pizza. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are, what are we going to do? We're going to say shucks and go home? Pastor used to say, we're going to say shucks and go home. Things fall apart. If you don't know that, you will. The old knees start creaking. Things fall apart. God stays the same. Troubles come. God doesn't flee. We don't want religiosity. We don't want a church that's filled. I'm so thankful. Uh, 39 years ago, this month, my parents came to Lennox. Uh, it was the summer of 1976. I remember the Olympics were on in Montreal. Sugar Ray Leonard. It's boxing. That's how all great moments in my life are remembered. What was happening in the sports world. And um, right, Tom Regan, 1986. Bill Buckner, ball through the feet. Tom was born. Um, <clears throat> it's my nephew, if you don't know that. So my parents came, and we left another type of church. And one of the things I noticed right away was the formality was gone. But there was this great excitement and joy. And you'd hear songs like, it's bubbling in the Sunday school. There's something bubbling in my life. And you hear songs like, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of old, or of the earth, whichever the right word is, either one grows strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Right? We turn our eyes upon Jesus because there's no darkness in Jesus. We turn our eyes upon Jesus because he is the hope of our calling. And that hope is not disappointed. He is faithful. We can trust him. We can walk in him. We can experience the life of Christ in our daily walk by forgetting that thing which we're seeing and seeing the thing which the Spirit allows us to see, which is above and beyond the circumstances. It's he's encompassed us about with his angels. And he's given us deliverance, and he's given us his presence. And in his presence is the fullness of joy. 
So instead of being in prison by our circumstances, we can be in the, the funny house. Not that funny house, but we can be in the house of joy, right? We can be mourning and we can experience incredible joy because of the presence of God. So I am so thankful this all happens because I am renewed daily in my thinking. The Holy Spirit has a place in my mind of refreshing and renewing and of regenerating. And I love that this morning hearing Pastor Bob speak about that, that our mind is not just patched up with a little bit of putty, but it is whew, restored. We don't have just a little better quality of Adam because we religiously attend church services. We come by the grace of God, and who, who even knows how many we come to, but we come to everyone we possibly can because the presence of God is there. And I want to be there to experience the life of Christ in the body because in the body is the presence of God. And in my house, in my little room, with my troubles piling up and my difficulties, there is death and depression. But in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And I have a tough time, and I go out in the street and soul win, and all I can think about is the kingdom of God and bringing people into it. And what happened to the tough time? Oh, forgot it. You're hiding your head in the sand. If that's hiding my head in the sand, it's a great place to be. It's the fullness of God, baby. That's what we believe in. The joy of Christ. The life hid with Christ. That that death produced resurrection life. Life. Life with God. So let's close by saying hallelujah. hallelujah. And by saying thank you to the presence of God. Okay, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, this morning, we are so thankful, Lord, that you, for the joy that was set before you, went to the cross, and you finished the work, became tetelestai. It is done. It's paid in full. And Lord, maybe there's somebody here this morning that's never had the opportunity to enter into these things. These things seem dark and unreachable, and today you would like to open their eyes to their understanding and bring them spiritual life that comes from knowing you. So if there's a person here who's never received Christ as their personal Savior, Make that decision to invite him into your heart today. He is anxiously awaiting to have fellowship with you and to be your savior and to fill you. So if that's you, we'd just like to offer you a, a gift. If you are receiving Christ for the first time, just slip your hand up so our ushers can, can see you. This is between you and God. It's a private decision, but it's one that you will celebrate all of eternity in the public of God's sight, God's, God's eternal purpose. So if you're here and you're making that decision, just slip your hand up. Okay, thank you, Lord, and thank you so much once again for your presence. Thank you that you visit us, God, and that you give us in the midst of, we, not that we are always taken out of trouble, but that you take us through that trouble and that we can experience you and your fellowship along the way. We thank you and we praise you in your precious name. Amen.